All right, good morning, I'm my family and friends. This is your favorite Sunday school teacher, Kay Edward Copeland, coming to you through the facilities of New Zion Baptist Church. And today we have our special guest, Dr. Pam Taylor, all the way from Miami, Florida. We're grateful to God for safe traveling grace for her, number one, uh, to, to get in here. And we're ready to get started with Sunday school after everybody comes on in the room and gets checked in. Again, for those of you who will be watching this later on in the day, later on in the week, we're still anticipating and asking that you would interact with us in the comment section. Um, as a matter of fact, today we'll give you opportunity to uh, ask questions as she uh, presents her lesson uh, to us. In just a second, I'm going to scoot over so we can make sure that she's <laughs> fully in the screen. But uh, right now, I need those of you who are coming in to let us know if you can hear and see us well. Uh, check in with us. As always, what we want you to do when you first check in, let us know how you're doing today. Using a word or a phrase, how would you describe your emotional, your mental, your spiritual state this morning? And then after you locate where you are, we want you to go ahead and type in the top three things you're most grateful for. So go ahead and do that right now. Sister Ruthie, are we coming through clear? Can you hear us well? Somebody, as you're coming in the room, let us know if uh, looks like the lighting is great. All right, daughter, thank you. Seems like we can here let's double check can you hear me your okay? mic let can you me hear me okay on there go ahead and start talking about tell them tell them a little bit about uh, who you are where you're from what your background is and then we'll adjust okay good morning everyone i'm dr pam taylor um i'm originally from kansas city missouri been in florida three years now i'm pastor copeland's cousin I'm glad to be here. I'm glad for staff to help us out so much this morning. I, my background is I am a master's and PhD counselor psychologist. I have a license in mental health and I'm licensed in both the state of Missouri and in the state of Florida. I am so thankful for what God has given me to do as far as reaching his people in the counseling world and in the Christian world. I hope that this morning I can bring you something that will help you bring you along if you write, if you not already gotten where you need to go, then we're going to get you there this morning. And if you have gotten where you want to go, please be sure to chime in and let us know how you did it and how you can help others. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you, they're saying your mic is coming through a little bit low. So I'm going to give you mine. Let's see if that makes any difference. So keep talking a little bit until we can get this adjusted. I'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about grief. The Lord recently has laid on my heart to talk about grief. I don't know what that was about. And once, one, at one point when he did that, I was concerned that he was getting me ready for a loss of life in my family or someone that I love dearly. But that didn't happen. And so what I realized in this past year is that he has commissioned me to speak to others about grief. And we're going to talk about grief in a different kind of way this morning. Is that better? Okay, they say they can hear you. The testimony is you can hear her much better now. I don't know if you can hear me or, or not. It doesn't make any difference. As long as you can hear her, I want to make sure that she has plenty of time. Talk about this really important subject. So everybody uh, continue to check in. And I want you to share this one. Make sure that you... As a matter of fact, uh, tag your account. Oh, yeah, accountability. We in the 30 day challenge. I forgot about <laughs> that. Y'all thought I thought you were slick. I, I haven't forgot. Matter of <laughs> fact, yesterday you were supposed to do 30, what was it? 30 glute bridges. What is it? Yeah. 30 hoop bridges. 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 Yeah, I can already say hoop bridges. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's glute, glute bridges. bridges. Hoop bridges. You're supposed yep. to do 30 bridges. So we want to make sure that. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to do that <laughs> yesterday, that you do it uh, today and continue on. As a matter of fact, I believe today we're supposed to, you're supposed to eat so much protein per meal. Okay. Matter of fact, this past week, I hope you were able to do that. Let me say this and then everybody should be checked in. The mics are uh, fine now, and so you can uh, go. Okay. Uh, 
This past week, you were supposed to do some meal planning. If I'm not mistaken, that was Thursday. You were supposed to put together a menu, plan out your stuff. So I really want you to do that because after the 30-day fitness challenge, which I'll come back at the end and talk about how we'll do the drawing and let you know uh, who the winner is, all that kind of stuff. After we get on the other side of pastoral celebration here these first two weeks of October, mm -hmm. then we're going to be doing 40 days of feasting. 40 days of feasting, not fast. You know, usually this time of year we do a 40-day fast. This year we're doing 40 days of feasting. Hmm. It's based on a book where we'll be feasting on the Word of God. But hmm. while we'll be feasting, I'll be challenging you as it relates to meal prep and meal planning and getting uh, calibrated, not by taking things out of your diet, by add, but by adding more vegetables and fruits and uh, some healthy things. It's a, it's a different take, a different sort of mentality. Uh, so we'll be talking about that at the end. Go ahead and tag your uh, accountability partner. Make sure that they're in uh, sync with this teaching that's going to go forth right now. And so now I'm getting out of the way. Everything <laughs> is set up well. Lighting is good. Sound is good. So let's hear from Dr. Pam Taylor. Good morning again. Thank you all. We're going to talk about grieving the life we dreamt of or dreamed of. We hear the word grief mostly when we've lost a loved one to death. I am going to come this morning speaking a little differently about grief because we do grieve other things. We grieve jobs, we grieve friendships, we grieve marriages, we grieve material things that we've worked hard for. And so some of those things are on the list of things that we have dreamed of. Dreamed of. Most of us set goals and have dreams about our future. And the goals were really what we thought were the right things to, to dream about. We dream about school or trade. We dream about moving out on our own. That looks a little different these, de these days for young people because it's hard to move out so quickly. But we have that dream that we want to get out on our own. We want, we want to get out of our parents' home. Uh, looking back today, I probably would have stayed a little longer, but we still had that dream. We dream of marriage. We dream of children. And then we dream of our children repeating our plan, but just doing it better. But we come across some hiccups during this plan. And um, some of the things that change our vision, change our dream, is the economy, job opportunities, the marriages that didn't make it, and with children having their own dreams. And we have to accept that. We have to accept that our children are not us. They want to have their own plan. They want to have their own vision. They have to go through the, some of the same things we have to go through, but only on their projection of time. So we have to get into a place where we understand that our dream does not equate to their dream. We grow up with these schemes in our head and in our minds and our spirits that things are supposed to go a certain way. We want, expect, and idealize the life of others that we've seen through our neighbors, through our friends, through our families, TV, and now today, especially social media. But we've got to come to a, a reckoning that what we see may not be the truth. What we see is not always what is real. We don't know what goes on in people's homes. We don't know what goes on in people's minds. We especially don't know what the truth is many times on social media. So we've got to come to a place where we start to understand what is real for us individually. Even though we have these hiccups, we keep fighting for the dream that we had, the dream that we grow up, and we fight hard for it. We, we go to extreme lengths to make sure we're going to get that dream that we started sometimes as children. Uh, we stay on the jobs that we dread getting up for. We fight for relationships without prayer. And then we push our children away many times. We push them away because they want to have their own dreams versus having our dream. What I've come to realize that many times we're, we're fighting because we're afraid of something. Fear is the basis of so much um, of how we move. We're afraid of not succeeding. We fear of what others think about us. And we fear of letting others down. 
And I, and I know that to be true. We don't want to ever let our parents down. We don't want to do that many times. We don't want to let um, our church down. And mainly we don't want to let us down, our own individual self down because of the dream that we have. We've got to get to a reckoning again that we are get, trying to get to a place where we don't let God down. And too many times we have not put God as the center of what's going on in our life. We just move and move and move. We, and we're praying about it, but we haven't asked him about it. We're praying about it. God, I know you'll do this for me. I have faith in you, but we have not checked in with him to make sure that it's for us. He had, we know that we know the scripture well. He, he knows, he knew about us before we were born. He knew what we were supposed to do, but many times we don't check in with him to say, God, okay, is, am I on the right path here? Am I walking down the right street? Am I talking to the right people? We just get up and say, okay, God, this is for me. I know it's right. And we keep on moving. So we have not said to ourselves, God, I don't want to let you down. And we got to have the, the respect fear of not letting God down as we move on in life. So during this fight, um, we've got to go back to the five stages of grief and how, what it looks like when we're fighting. There is a theory in the world of psychology called the five stages of grief. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote about it many years ago, and she wrote about it when she was thinking about a person who had terminal illness, had a terminal illness, and what they were going through as they were dying. It has transcended into what is what we're thinking when we're losing someone or, we, or after we have lost someone to death. But we're going to talk about it again this morning as far as dreaming our life and, and grieving the life that we didn't get. So the five stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. They don't always go in that order. They go back and forth sometimes, but they're the five stages that we look at when we're grieving. While these stages are commonly accepted in the psychological circus, circles, we as believers can find additional layers of meaning and comfort by integrating our faith into the grieving process. So when we think about denial, it's the first reaction to loss. When we, are, when we have, when we're going on our life, I'm sorry, and we have the first hiccup that we mentioned, we've lost the job, we've lost the house, we've lost the relationship. It is a, it is a defense to keep fighting for it because we have denied in our spirits. We're denying in our spirits that it's not going to be, it's not going to go that way. We're going to, it's going to go our way. We are not going to lose the life that I dreamt about. We have some numbness. And the reality of my loss, our loss, is too overwhelming to grasp in the beginning. So it's a defense mechanism. We just continue to deny it instead of saying, okay, this is not for me. I'm going to deny it. I'm going to keep working toward it. But when we look back, we realize we were in denial that the process had started, that that life that we dreamt of is over. In the denial process, it's okay to be there for a minute, for a little while. Just remember that God is with you during that whole time. He is just waiting on you to get to the place where he wants you to be. Psalms 34, 18 says that he is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in the spirit. So while we might be there and we might be in denial, God is still with us. Don't try to rush through any part of the process. Just kind of go through it. Step two the stage two is anger, and it's, it's also a natural response to feeling hopeless and powerless. I'm going to put a pen there for a second. One of the hierarchies of emotions that I relate to or, and give to clients a lot is disappointment, frustration, hurt, anger, and rage. Something happens and we become disappointed. If it keeps happening, we get frustrated. More frustration turns into hurt. More hurt turns into anger. What we never want to happen is to get to rage. Rage takes us to a place where people describe as, I saw red or I blacked out. I didn't know what I was doing. So what we have to do when we get to anger is get back down to a place of, why am I hurting? 
What what has happened to keep me at this place? We don't want to keep walking in anger all the time. It, it, it causes us to lose more relationships. It causes us to uh, get ulcers. It causes us to just fly off the handle when we don't want to. So anger has its place, but we have to use it in a way that is working for us. And unfortunately, too many times, it's not working for us. We might be able to feel the anger, but again, we have to turn to God. Even David cried out to God when he said, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? This feeling of anger is valid, but bring your anger to God before taking it to other people, before taking it out on other people. Because your life is not going like you thought it would be, you might have some anger, but you got to remember again that God is with you. Anger has its place, but we never want it to get to rage. Stage three is the bargaining stage. And here's where you'll be saying things like, well, if I do this differently, I'll get back to the life. I get back on the path that I want to be on dreaming my dream. You'll, you'll find yourself saying, if only. You'll find yourself searching for meaning behind where you are at that place. I'm only at this place, God, or, or sister, or brother, or husband, because you didn't do something, so now I need you to do something differently. The thoughts are natural, but remember that God's plan is beyond our understanding. Our if-onlys have nothing to do with what God may be thinking. It's God's plan for our life, and we have to trust him and surrender our lives to his control. God's ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. When we are bargaining for, to get our life back on track where we want it to be, or even after we've figured out that it's not going to be that way, we cannot stay in the place where I should have done something different. We've got to get to a place at this point where we say, I'm going to do something different and I need to get on the path that God would have me to be on. Trust in God's sovereignty and allow his ultimate plan to help you relinquish the need to control or understand every aspect of your life. It's hard to give up control. Um, it's hard to give up control of our lives because we want what we want. And we many times want what we think God is saying we should have. But the control at this point comes to God, tell me what to do. Tell me what I do next. That is where the control has to go. I'm moving a little fast. If, if there's any questions that come up yet? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, I'm moving really fast. Stage four is depression. This is the stage that we start to get worried as clinicians for the people that we love. When we have lost the house, that we worked hard for. When we've lost the relationship that we were had for 30 plus years, that can be very consuming. It is a, it is a very hurtful place. It's consuming and it's okay to feel depression for just a little while. The feeling of emptiness, hopelessness, and profound sorrow are very real and valid. But in these moments of darkness, remember that, again, God is with you. What we don't want to happen is what we call complicated grief. And that's where the person or we get in bed and don't want to get out. We've lost the house and we don't want to get up and go try to figure out where we're going to go next. Uh, we, we just, we stop caring for our bodies. We stop caring for our minds. We cop, stop caring for our spirits. Depression looks like that when we're grieving. What we don't want is complicated grief where it just continues and it, it becomes too un unbearable to move forward. We don't want that to happen. God walks beside us through the valley of sorrow. Allow yourself to lean on his strength and support your faith and through your community. Remember, you are not alone. God surrounds you even in the depths of your pain. Psalms 23, 4 says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Depression is real. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the 10th degree of sadness. But we never want anyone to stay there for too long. 
It is understandable. God knows our pain. Many of the greats in the Bible were depressed. God cried, Jesus cried tears of blood before he was uh, crucified. So he knows our pain. He knows what life looks like for us down here. And he knows what's best for us also. As you're healing through the, the phase of depression, just remember God is with you. And then finally, the stage five is acceptance. And it does not mean that you still don't have pain. It just means you finally get to a point where you're saying, okay, what I thought was for me is not for me. It acknowledges the reality of the situation. And then you say, okay, how do you move forward? How, what do I need to do move forward? And this is where you go into prayer, maybe prayer and fasting for the Lord to tell you, what do I need to do? Now, I want to stop there for just a minute. Um, one of the things that I like sharing with people is it had to happen. That is hard for many people to hear. It had to happen that I lost my house. It had to happen that I lost a child. It had to happen that I lost the relationship. But on the other side of it, what we realize is it had to happen for us to get to the place that God would have us to be. It had to happen so we can move forward in the way that he would have us to move, that we would know some things. It sounds hard, but there's, there's a, his plans are not the way that we would plan, and we got to remember that. So if you could get to the point where you can remember and say out loud, it had to happen, you've got to a good place. Reaching acceptance doesn't mean your pain has disappeared. It means you're finding a new way to live with the loss. This stage is about adjusting and discovering a new normal. As believers, acceptance is intertwined with hope. My private practice is called New Hope Counseling Center. I named it that over 20 years ago because what I realized, people were coming to me who had no hope. No hope, and, and they were just giving up. And what we want you to know at this stage of, accept, of acceptance is that there is always hope especially as believers, there's always hope in what God would have us to do. Let's let this hope give you strength and peace as you move forward. God's promises are true and his love is eternal. Revelation 21, four provides a beautiful vision of this hope. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So after we've made it through the five stages, now what do we do? Question is, God, what do you have in store for me? What is your purpose for my life? We move beyond the fear and we walk in faith because now we've checked in with God and we know for sure this is what he, have, we, he has for us to do. There is no doubt. It's not about a childhood dream anymore. It's about God. Is in our, he's walking in our spirit and we are being led by the Holy Spirit. We've got the plan and now we are writing the vision and making it plain. There's a new theory out by, <coughs> excuse me, a, a gentleman named Dev, David Kessler and it's called Finding Meaning, the Sixth Stage of Grief. The, the essence of that is even after a death, there's meaning. And even after the loss of the dream that we had, there's meaning. Again, it had to happen. That's what we're saying to ourselves. David Kessler had a son who died at 21, and he was an expert in grief. When people asked him, how did he work through that? He reminded them that he didn't come as a clinician. He didn't come as a grief expert when his son died. He came as a man, a father who lost his child. He had to go through all the five stages of grief. And then he decided there's something more. After, after heartbreak, he kept going through it. He realized there was still meaning. The book is coming out. He's doing some, he's done workshops and he's done uh, podcasts and doing things like that. So there's a book coming out and it's called The Sixth Stage Meaning. He needed to find meaning in the loss of his son. We can find loss in a broken heart. Here we find the meaning the Holy Spirit was leading us to earlier many times. Many times God is talking to us way back when we were 19, 17, 14. 
30, all that. We, he's talking to us, but we kind of just put it to the side. We do a little bit of it. We kind of tip our tiptoe into the waters of what he's telling us to do. But here in meaning, we're saying we're going all the way in. We're not going to let anything keep us from doing what God would have us to do anymore. And we find the purpose and we move forward. There's no more denial. There's no more frustration. Well, there might be some frustration in trying to get it done when people don't work with us, but it's not the, it's not the frustration of not doing what God would have us to do. Again, we realize what happened in the past had to happen. We realized there were some things and some people that we had in our lives should not have been there. We realized that it was just our own flesh that had it there, that had the people there, that had the job there, that had the house there, and even sometimes even had the church there that should not have been in our lives. And we realize it's okay to make the change. Here's where I want to stop and start saying, we cannot do this without the word of God. When we return back to the word, we will make things right with God and when we're working in our purpose. Second Corinthians, the first chapter in the fourth verse says, helping others through our, well, helps us to understand that we can help others through our pain. Second Corinthians, first chapter in the fourth verse. We have to be reminded from Psalms 119 and 33 that the, that the Lord orders our steps. When we were out of step, he let us go there so we could be reminded of it later, so we could learn from it, we could get meaning from it, but he's ordering our steps. Psalm 62 says, all of our expectations are from the Lord. Too many times we have our expectations in um, the money that we're earning, our jobs, the people in our lives. We expect so much from people that they can't give. We expect so much from jobs that they're not going to give. We expect things from money when it may fail us because the economy just does what it wants to do. So we have to put our expectations in the Lord and let him deliver to us what he would have. Proverbs the fourth chapter, 25 and 26 says, walk on the path that God would have for you. Isaiah 55 and 8 says, his ways are not our ways. And when we get that, that means so much. Um, I may be wrong when I say that, and Pastor Copeland, you can correct me, but God is not always a rational God. <laughs> He's God. And if we think at the Bible, think about the stories in the Bible, there's a lot of things that don't make sense to us, but we know that it is truth. So his ways are not our ways. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, trust in the Lord with your whole heart. And if we're only trusting the Lord, trusting in the Lord with a part of our heart for what we want, then we're not giving him our whole heart. Philippians 1, 3 through 6. And this is the one that has, I want you want to stick here. It has a lot of inter interpretations, but it is a source of comfort and inspiration. This verse can be comforting in times of weakness or pain and inspiring when motivation is needed to continue in the faith. And the verse says, Philippians 1, 3 through 6, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident in this of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So whatever we've gone through, whatever we're going through, God is working through us and he's going to get us right before the end. So when you're going through, just remember this is a part of the plan. This is how I'm growing up. This is how I'm developing. This is how I'm maturing in Christ and I'm going to be right when Jesus Christ comes back. And that's what I have for you this morning. I hope I have been able to deliver something that you can hear and take from here. And if there's any questions, just let us know. Wow. <laughs> Man, so let's go back over a couple of things okay. as it relates to those five stages of, of grief. Mm -hmm. In your, as it relates to your practice, mm -hmm. have you seen any patterns as it relates to where people typically get stuck the most? Or is it in the you know, is it so personal and so individualized mm -hmm. that you can't really discern any patterns or anything like that? When we're talking about the, the, when, the dreams of life. When we're talking about the dreams of life. Yeah, anger. 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 People get angry and they're mad at people for not doing what they felt should happen. Mm. 
or they're angry with themselves for not doing something they know they should have done to get them in their dream. But I want to I want to stop there and say that many times I don't think we do the things that we think we should do because God didn't allow it. Mm. God doesn't allow us to do everything we want to do because it's not a part of his plan for our life. And then there's many believers get uh, very angry with God. Well, what? I'm believing in God. Right, right. Yeah, you know, that's what he told me to do. Have faith, believe, and now it's not coming through. So a lot of people get stuck in the anger phase. So I want to dig down in that anger phase because you uh, talked in that piece about anger, about making sure that like anger doesn't, you, you mentioned something about disappointment and then something else and then oh, make yes. sure that anger yes. doesn't turn into rage. So put a pin right there. Okay. But the reason I'm asking about that, and you sort of proved a point, I've, I'm in a relationship and talking to several couples literally around the country, not okay. here in Rockford, mm -hmm. where the issue is somebody's angry about how the marriage isn't turning out how they planned it to turn out. Mm -hmm. And I did everything I was supposed to do or before we got married, you know, in other words, I've, a couple of people I'm talking to, well, before we got married, before I got married, I fasted, I prayed, I, you know, was living right and this, that, nothing. And now here the marriage isn't working out. So they're having trouble. And matter of fact, I even had a challenge with one person. I said, so the point is you're really angry at God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they finally had to, they were afraid to admit it, but that's really <laughs> what it was. Yeah. Well, oh, some several thoughts went through my mind, especially with couples. And I, I know this for, to be true myself. Many times we marry, but it's not the person God had us to marry. It's, it's not. So we have to get make some peace with that, too. So. Period. I'll stop there. Uh, the anger is at God, but it's, it, it needs to come down. Did I make a decision based on God's? will for my life. So I'll stop there. Then I'll go back. Is that, is that the answer? Yeah. So keep on question? going. Okay. So keep on going. So if I'm in it now, say that you uh, were, for lack of a better word, walking in the flesh when you made the decision, but uh -huh. you're in it now. Uh -huh. How do you work yourself through these, through this process without turning into bitterness and rage? Um, that, that's a very, Oh, that's a deep question, Pastor. I don't know. I don't remember, because what I, I think marriage is a great thing and I, we all want it to work. And so you will have more experience on how do you make a, a marriage work that was a flesh in the beginning. So that's going to come. I'm going to let the pastors take care of that because what I don't want to ever say is get a divorce. That's, that's just too easy. Uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't pray about it first, so just walk away. That's not what I ever want to say. Uh, but you have to work through it. And if the, and God can heal. God can heal and he will heal if it is his, if, if it is his will. So put a pin right there because I want you to be thinking about the piece about the don't taint, let anger turn into rage, rage or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm. So let me address that right quick Okay. because it's come up. Matter of fact, I think it came up last week. I uh, pointed out I was at an arts thing and a guy told a story about this woman who thought she married the perfect person. Okay. And then like eight years into the marriage, it's a novel, and I forgot the name of it. Eight years into the marriage, the guy had changed and he started becoming abusive mm -hmm. and this, that, and other. Mm -hmm. And she stayed in the marriage. And he was like, did she make a mistake marrying him? I said, well, a couple of things you got to remember. Number one, very often we're, sometimes we're walking in the flesh. Sometimes we're doing the best that we know how to do where we are in that phase of life. Mm -hmm. Given the information that we have, the key is how do you adjust as you get new information? <laughs> That's the question. That's the question. Yeah. Because maybe you could have started out with a fool mm. and then you pray or whatever. And then that joker, you turn around. I've, I've seen this where Absolutely. somebody's married to somebody who's an alcoholic or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the joker fool around and get saved, get right and all that type of thing. And then the marriage doesn't work out because the person who had been the victim or mm. not the victim, but the person who had in, in their mind played the victim all along. Mm -hmm. Once that person gets straight, they don't ever make the adjustment. Right. And then now things don't work out. And I've seen the opposite where somebody starts out all right. And then over time, because of bad habits or not, not boundaries, not walking in community with others, 
then the person, uh, one person or, or another changes and really is starting walking contrary to God, but the other person is clinging mm -hmm. without making the adjustment. Mm -hmm. Okay. I got to adjust to the reality that's right here, right yeah. now yeah. and make the appropriate boundaries Boundary. and hang on to those boundaries. Because when I say boundaries, <laughs> what I'm talking about is, very often we speak too much in absolutes that, okay, I'm just going to stay in it or I'm going to get a divorce. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of wiggling room there, in between there. There is. There I is. can set some boundaries and, you know, make standards and whatever. And then if they don't uh, abide by them, then we, you know, deal with the consequences mm -hmm. or we can do some other things. We can have a series, a, a season of uh, isolation because if you're sowing disrespect, you're supposed to reap some distance. Yeah. So that you, because the Bible even talks about that, that, hey, if somebody's acting a fool, go talk to them. Absolutely. And then say, wait a minute, now here's about it. If they don't listen to you, get two or three other people, right. go talk to them. Right. And if they don't listen to that, then, okay, okay, so you disrespecting the whole body. So we're going to give you some distance. Now we have withdrawn the right hand of fellowship for the purpose of getting you to think about what you're doing. And then maybe you might come to your senses. Uh -huh. And if you don't, well, hey, we did everything we could. If you come to your senses, great, we'll welcome you back. Absolutely. But we're not just, it's not just, okay, at the first instance of any aberration of behavior, we're going to cut you completely off. Mm -hmm. We're going to try certain things. We're going to establish boundaries and work through a process. One of the things I want to say about boundaries um, in any relationship is too many times, we set the boundaries and they're good boundaries. But then we don't, we don't, we, we mess up our own, we That's cross it. our own boundaries. That's it. And so we have to be really careful with that. But boundaries are, are essential in any good relationship. We, and especially when you're having some issues and some current concerns to walk through. Second thing I want to say is in relationships, when one person is trying very hard and the other person is, is having some issues going on, both people are developing in some kind of way. Mm. And so with, if this person who's been having some issues or drinking or abusive and they, you know, they're trying to get better, this person might be healing at the same time. And that person who's got healed, when this person gets at a good place, their mind might have changed. Mm. Their spirit might have changed. And so you got to figure out how to reconcile those two people at, a, at those points. At that point. At that point, because things may have just changed for both people. Right. Yeah. And so the boundaries are, in, are instrumental. But we got to also remember that both people are developing at the, at the same time, but doing in different ways. In different ways. Yeah. So that's essential. And the only way that there can be reconciliation is to accept and acknowledge where we are right now. Exactly. Where, not where we were. Right. Or where you ought to be. It's where we are right now. Where are we right now? Exactly. And then let's see if we can, let's get God in this and let's see how we can work this out. Can't do it without God. Yeah. Can't do it without God. Now, let's get back to the anger okay. piece, because you said something I had never heard before. I thought it was good. You, okay. You, sort of almost like a mini thing. You said, don't let disappointment turn into this. And yeah. Then, then that In relationships, that. and when we're losing uh, the, the, the life that we dreamt of, we get disappointed. Mm. We might have some disappointment. And we're like, oh, I, don't, I don't know what that was about. It just kind of happened. If it keeps happening, it becomes frustration. I don't know why this keeps happening, but it needs to stop. And I need it's something, somebody needs to change or something needs to happen. But <laughs> if I'm frustrated now, and then if it keeps happening after frustration, we become hurt and we kind of just mm. kind of feel like, okay, I don't know why I'm hurting, but this hurts me. My emotions are hurting. My spirit is hurting. Uh, it's, it's a phase where we just feel like the world is against me I, mm. I, and I don't like this. Something nothing's going in, in my favor and I don't know why. So that hurt phase is where we need to really stop and adjust some things. Mm. That's where we need to stop and say, do, what do I need to do differently? What do I, what boundaries do I need to set? Who do I need to talk to? Do I need to go get counseling? After hurt, if you have not done any of those things, if it keeps happening, mm -hmm. okay, I'm mad now. I'm mad at the world. I'm mad at I'm mad at people. I'm mad at God. I'm mad at myself for staying here. Whatever the case may be, and anger, it takes a hold on us if we don't stop it there. Because then, if we stay in the anger mode, 
we just stay angry. We go to work angry. We go to church angry. We talk to our children angry. We talk to our spouse or our significant other, our friends. We're just angry all the time. And we you can we walk through the room and you can tell when yeah. we're angry. Okay. Right. So, but at anger, if we let it get to rage, it'll get to rage because one more disappointment might take us mm. to this level of rage. It might not be the same person that has hurt us. It might not be the 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 loss that I've had. It may be another disappointment that just takes me to rage. And so we've got to get to a point where we never go to rage because rage gets us in trouble. Right. Rage gets us in trouble. We've hurt somebody. We've hurt ourselves. We, we've said some things that we should not have said. We, and it, it, we will have more of a loss. So we don't want to see red. We don't want to black out. We don't want to start fighting and shooting and all those kinds of things. We want to get back down to why am I hurting? That's it. See, mm -hmm. rage is where my lawyer hat comes in because that's that's the criminal justice yeah, system. Absolutely. <laughs> most people, most mm -hmm. murders, most um, aggravated batteries, most crimes against the body are people who know each other. Yeah, right. And it's because of what you're literally describing mm -hmm. right now. But what you've also described helps us in this, what we were just talking about in terms of marriage because sometimes, or relationships, period, not just marriage, sometimes even friendships. And friendships, yeah disappointment frustration hurt now once we get the hurt that's you got to make some ad adjustments now we really do but see what we'll do is and what i've seen happen in uh married couples as well as friendships they they they, they get to that hurt part but then they move into anger and it's hard to mm -hmm. it's back. harder to get back mm -hmm. if you don't deal with it when it's a hurt piece and deal with a few different things that you've pointed out a few different times. Number one, what does God say about this? Is, yeah. is God in the, is I, have I brought him in the process? Have I acknowledged where I might have not been listening to him or mm. where he might have been trying to give me some warnings along the way? Right. And then also that's where community comes in mm -hmm. as it relates to, man, um, whether it be a therapist, whether it be your pastor, right. do I have a community, do I have a group who can pray with me right. and hold me accountable as I try to set boundaries exactly. in this piece because you you said it right. You set the boundaries, but then either you violate the boundaries or ain't no consequences or whatever, right. mm -hmm. and then you wonder why you're getting why, what you got. Why I keep getting hurt? Why do I keep hurt? Because I, I keep going against my own boundaries. Keep going against my own boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's it. And it happens so often, it, even even in, the, in church. Mm -hmm. In churches, instead of somebody coming to the pastor and saying, I'm hurt, Pastor. I've hurt that this happened. I think he's angry. I get raised. I'm telling everybody that you're, mm -hmm. I'm out. I'm just going to leave. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to learn how to be more Christ-like instead of getting to that place. And, and hurt is the place to do it. Hurt is the place where you can really communicate what's going on. You can't even communicate at anger and rage what's really going on. You can say I'm mad because you did this at that time, but the anger is really coming from the place of hurt. And so you got to go back to I'm hurt because this keeps happening. So I hope that, uh, yeah, that thing, disappointment, frustration, hurt, anger, and blackout rage. We don't want to do that. We don't want to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Now you said uh, something else as you were talking, as you were going through the stages of grief, it, for whatever reason, it sort of made me think of the book of Job mm. and how he had to work through a whole bunch of stuff. But your bottom line was, Okay, it had to happen because there was there's some meaning right on the back end of of this. What what have you seen or what has been your experience as you've been working with people through grief? What do you think helps them to get to that sixth stage of meaning? You know, the book of Job, I love the book of Job, and I, I want to go back just a, just for a second in one of the verses in the book of Job. When Job was talking to his friends, and they were trying to figure out, okay, Job, you, something happened here. You did something. The, the one verse that stands out was Job says, the thing that I feared the most has come upon me. Mm, yeah. Now, I never read where God said you were afraid that this was going to happen. But that's what Job said. Job said, the thing that I feared the most has come upon me. So in the world of psychology, we kind of call that the self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. So I wonder, I wonder, and I believe that if fear is what draws us 
to our losses. What, mm. You know, we, because God, wa- God does not want us to walk in fear. We're going to either right. have faith or fear. One of the one, one of the two. Right. And so he's going to work this thing out of us. So if it means we got to go through the thing, mm. so we won't be afraid anymore. Yeah. Then that's what it's going to mean. But that's, that verse really stands out. Either we're going to, the thing that I feared the most has come upon me. So we don't want to be afraid. Um, how we get to the end, like Job did, is we just keep walking it out and finding meaning like he did. Because when he talked to God in the end, he said, let me shut my mouth because I don't know nothing. <laughs> That's basically what he said, right? right? And so we get to the point where we, we're accepting and we say we know that God is real. And that's how we how I encourage believers that even through all of this pain, we know God loves us. He wants the best for us and that there's reason for it. And they get to that point once they have started to heal. And long, as long as we don't, the person doesn't stay in that stage of depression, mm. they can get through it better. It's okay to mourn the loss of the life or the person. It's okay to mourn that. It's okay to grieve that. It's, it's normal. But there's actually meaning into it somewhere, and we get them there when we can get them to the place where they re- remember that God is with them. I, okay. Yeah. There it is right there. So uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the comment section because we're only going to take another. There's one. I'm sorry. Where did you? Let me see here. Okay, I'm sorry. When grieving a loss of someone of whom you still share space with, what should the next steps be? Grieving the loss of someone who you still have to share space with. Okay. It sounds like a relationship is ending, but they're still living in the same home. Is that? Okay. Or in the same job, same worship space. Uh, you know, we kind of talked about this. Um, mm-hmm. That's a tough one. If you are strong enough to do that, and it takes strength to do that. You have to be very strong. If, you, if, you, if the relationship is ending, has ended, you have to be okay with saying, that just was not for me. And if you can get to that place of strength, okay. But if you cannot get there, don't torture yourself right. by keeping in the same space with, space with someone that has hurt you that may cause you anger or rage, that might keep you in a place of depression. You've got to make a conscious decision to say, I'm okay and I can deal with that, or I can't and I've got to move forward. I've got to move on. It, it, it's hard to do that. So, it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's talk about worship spaces and we'll talk about some other spaces. So in worship spaces, remember, and we've done this as a church, uh, we've taken people who've been I heard at some other church and maybe sometimes mm-hmm. we had them under watch care mm-hmm. because at that point, while something was being worked out, you know, within the church, mm-hmm. it was just too much right. for them to be there. Now, eventually when the situation gets resolved or the persons are healed or whatever, okay, you might be able to go back. Right. But just remember that in Christ, it, it, everybody going to heaven ain't going from one church. Exactly. So <laughs> it's all right. And I've had situations too where, Something was going on here, and we told a person, you know what, for this season, you probably, I'm, I'm thinking of a, actually a preacher right now, said for this season, we're sending you over to such and such hmm. a church. Okay. And they went over there, got in their small groups, worked everything out, hmm. came back a whole different wow. type of thing. So you do have, I guess what I'm trying to say is you do have flexibility. It's not just either stay here, right. I'm going to grit and bear mm-hmm. it. Or I'm just going to say, forget all of y'all. Right. There's something in between there. But to your point, don't sit up and torture yourself. No. By being in the, now, no. some no. situations, like, for example, if it's a work situation where, okay, you got to go to work and there's some things there. Even there, there's some ways that you can uh, talk to HR, talk to supervisors, talk to the people who are, or, or even if, if, um, administration can't do anything. There are ways that you can set even physical boundaries Mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't put yourself in situations where you're triggered Mm -hmm. or where you have to unnecessarily be exposed to things that remind you of trauma. Absolutely. And that is traumatic. (laughs) That is very traumatic. I am most concerned about, I I, I feel like I want to make sure that we don't miss if two people are living in the same home 
and the relationship has ended and they're trying to figure out how to move on financially. Mm. That happens a lot. Yeah. Um, how do you grieve that is that you have to make sure you keep your personal space in the home. You have to make sure you have some accountability partners outside of the home, someone you can talk to regularly, that you don't find yourself getting in, back entangled with uh, the somebody that's going to hurt you over and over again. If the relationship is indeed over, you have to remind yourself that it is indeed over right. and keep yourself accountable with uh, other people that love you and care for you. Now you've, I think you've hit on one of the key pieces right there, and that is none of this is, none of anything we've talked about thus far, and I think you would agree, is, how can I say this? You can't do this by yourself. You need God's help, but you need people. People. Yes. Mm -hmm. You need accountability. Mm -hmm. You need, whether, you need a team. You need your therapist. You need your pastor. You need Absolutely. your friends. You, you need, need accountability. accountability. Because if you, you could, could do it by yourself, yourself, you probably wouldn't have gotten <laughs> right. that far down yeah, into absolutely. the thing. Absolutely. You need some accountability, some people who can walk with you mm -hmm. and know what's happening so that they can hold you accountable. It's very interesting. I'm talking to a, uh, a relative on the other side of the family mm -hmm. uh, over the weekend and was dealing with some stuff. And I told this individual, okay, make sure that you're staying stay safe. I know... Mm -hmm that you want to work things out or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now that I know right. what you're going through, right. I'm telling you Absolutely. that I'm watching Absolutely. and I'm watching the other person and I'm going to need you because mm -hmm. I don't want to have to come down there. Right. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> right. But that was because she let me in. I'll say, okay, now yeah. we got... Hey, when you let me in, I'm, I'm part of it now. Yeah, now I'm part of it. And now we we going to work this out. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Anything else? We getting ready to close. Man, that time went by... <laughs> I gotta have you come. You know what? Okay. We're gonna have you. Uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Zoom or something? We're gonna do this <laughs> digitally because this was too good. We didn't even get. Time is already gone. Was there one more question before we go? Just one came in. Let's see. Where is this? <laughs> oh, you've done oh, it. It clicked. Oh, she took it off. Okay. I was just getting ready to read. Okay, wait a minute. Let's see. When the dream is attached to two people and the level of acceptance bring about different meaning for each person, how do you reach alignment on whether to grieve the process versus the dream? That's a deep question. Read it to me one more time. Let's see. When the dream is attached to two people mm -hmm. and the level of acceptance brings about different meaning for each person, that apparently, in other words, as you've gone through something and you've gotten down into the grieving process all the way to the acceptance piece. How do you reach alignment on whether the, whether to grieve the process versus the dream? Mm -hmm. Actually, I thought I understood it. Until <laughs> yeah, because I think what I'm hearing is that they haven't, maybe they haven't really accepted that the dream is over. Okay. Maybe the process that they're going through they think looking at getting to the dream by different processes. Ah. Maybe that's what I'm hearing. And so that's where you got to stop. If the, if you have come to God and God has said, yes, that dream is what it is, write the vision, make it plain, then the vision has to be written together. But it's only one process. Right. It's only one process. And so if you if the two people cannot align themselves on the process, then there's something going awry with the dream. It's not going to happen if it is of God. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And again, that's where that whole uh accountability as it relates mm -hmm. to whether it be therapists, you know, mm -hmm. bringing, uh, when I say bringing other people, I'm not telling, I'm not saying share all your business, uh, <laughs> you know, come down before the church, Ch child, we haven't, no, <laughs> I'm talking about trusted partners Absolutely. who have wisdom. We got people here at New Zion been married 55, 60, mm -hmm. you know, 60 uh, plus years who can sit down <laughs> with you and work through a process. Well, we're going to close this thing out. Dr. Taylor is going to be with us at 3 o'clock today. Come come hear her live at 3 o'clock today. We have our fifth weekend fellowship, New Zion North. That is New Zion Baptist Church in Beloit, Emmanuel Baptist Church in Beloit, and Jerusalem Baptist Church here in uh, Rockford, where uh, Pastor Rodney Hayes is the pastor. Pastor Ivy is the pastor of New Zion North, and Pastor Newburn. Emmanuel, all of we'll all be together here at 3 p.m. Uh, Dr. Taylor will be addressing us 
then you'll have a time of fellowship and good food and all that type of thing. So come on out at 3 p.m. here at New Zion South, New Zion Missionary Baptist Church. Our address is 4726 Jasper Street or otherwise known as 4747 South Riverside, just past the uh, Walmart here on Central if you're going west and uh, come and get the rest of it. You just got a one dose. You need two doses. You ain't going, you, if you're sick, you got to take the full dosage if you're going to be all right. So come on back. And if you want, yeah, just let us know in the comment section. I, I feel like we need to have her back and maybe do some things. Uh, she's in Miami, but thank God for technology. We can work it out on Zoom and do a Facebook thing and all that kind of stuff. Praise God. So Praise let God. us know what you think. And make sure you share this with I told you. Didn't I tell you at the beginning? You need to share this video on your own personal Facebook page and get this out to some other people. Uh, 30 day challenge, we're down to the end. So today, make sure you're eating your protein. Make sure you get out to worship. Amen. Love you with the love of the Lord. We'll catch you next week. Amen.